Hello, I'm David Griffin. If the world in which we find ourselves in is the creation of a God who is perfect in goodness and power, why is there so much evil in this world, so much suffering, so much injustice? This is surely the problem which has been the most difficult one for Christians and Jews. Process theology has provided a distinctive answer to this question, which many people have found very helpful. However, even though process theology has now been around for about a half century, relatively few people know about it, or at least know it well enough for it to provide any help on this problem. Process theology has articulated in its, its position in a language and a style which most people find forbidding. I myself wrote a rather big book on this problem. We still have many unsold copies available. In 1981, Rabbi Harold Kushner wrote a short and simple book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. He wrote not out of a philosophical perspective, but out of his own personal struggle with the problem and out of his own work as a rabbi. He spoke directly and authentically from the heart. His book became a national bestseller. It confirmed what we had always suspected that if this kind of position were articulated in a way that was widely accessible to people, it would evoke a positive response from most. In 1982, partly because of the popularity of the rabbi's book, John Dart wrote an article that appeared on the front page of the Los Angeles Times, which was on process theology and the problem of evil. It featured John Cobb and myself as representatives of this school of thought, and also, also Rabbi Harold Kushner, indicating that his position was quite similar. The article created quite a stir in the editorial pages. Because of all this attention, CBS Evening News picked up the story. And on the Dan Rather report, early in January of 1983, there was a special segment featuring me and Rabbi Kushner uh, under a storyline entitled Process Theology and the Problem of Evil. Because of this, the rabbi has become widely associated in the public mind with this school of thought. Because of our mutual interest, we have wanted now to get together and be able to talk things over. Finally, early in 1984, while the rabbi was on a lecture tour, on the West Coast, we were able to get together for a few hours to have a discussion. Part of our discussion we decided to have in public and held in the United Methodist Church in Claremont, California on February 20th. We planned this as a, an interview in which John Cobb would interview the rabbi uh, in front of an audience. This is the tape you're now about to see. Uh, I think that all of your being here tonight means that a great many of you have already read Rabbi Kushner's book, but I'm sure also that some of you have heard from people who've read it and have been told that this is a good event to come to, that you should get acquainted with him. And especially for your benefit, I'd like to ask you, Rabbi Kushner, to begin by just telling us very briefly why you wrote the book and uh, something of what its main point is. Sure. Uh, how is the camera range? Uh, am I expected to stand uh, up and do I, this? I think, I think the problem is that we originally hoped we could just sit, but when we saw how many rows of people were there, we were afraid it just wouldn't work that way. That'll be fine. I, <coughs> excuse me. I don't know who all of you are, but I'm delighted that you're here. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. If there's anybody who can't hear me, buy my book because everything I have to say is in there. <laughs> As you've heard, I, I had tried to get out here to Claremont last year when I was in the area, but my time was not my own. My publisher had arranged for a number of appearances down here, and it was their insistence that I spend my day in Los Angeles talking to Merv Griffin, not David Griffin. <laughs> I had grown up as a conventionally religious Jew and gone into the rabbinate, believing that everything that happened was God's will, and that if I couldn't understand it, the problem was not with God, it was with me, that I couldn't understand it. And then I got married, and we had a son, and when our son was three years old, and we'd been taking him to doctors because he had not been growing and thriving and putting on weight, 
The doctors told us that he suffered from a very rare disease called progeria, rapid aging. You may remember about three years ago, there were those two little boys who went to Disneyland. They had the same illness that our son had died of, progeria. The doctors told us that he would never grow beyond the size of a three-year-old. He would lose all his hair. He would begin to suffer from the ailments of old age, arthritis and hardening of the arteries and congestive heart failure when he was still a child and he would die in his early teens. We simply could not make sense of that news against the background of what I had been taught. And I came to, after much crisis, I came to certain conclusions about God's role in our lives, not as a theologian, not trying to argue logically what is an acceptable concept of God, but as a cruelly hurt parent with overflowing pain and outrage, trying to say this could not possibly be God's will. There is, first of all, a long and honorable tradition in Judaism of calling God to account in the name of justice. Abraham, who stands up when God threatens to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and says to God, if there are any innocent people there, you can't do it because you're a God of justice. Job, who says at one point in his book, whatever happens to me, I have to believe that God appreciates my honesty more than he appreciates your flattery. And other later heroes of Judaism who have said to God, you cannot do that which is less than just and less than fair. I had to come up with some way of believing that God was good, of trying to understand why my son would suffer and die if there was a God in the world, and why other innocent people were suffering and dying, and I, as the rabbi, was ministering to them. I had to try and understand why in what is allegedly God's world, you turn on the news every night and it begins with a story of an accident, a fire, an earthquake. You pick up your newspaper any morning and you find more evidence of murders and robberies and human suffering. My conclusion was, if I am compelled to choose between a powerful God who is not good or a good God who is not powerful, I had to opt for God's goodness as the more religious alternative. I had to believe that a God worthy of worshiping would not want these terrible things to happen, and that perhaps there were forces in the universe which operated independently of God's will. That the idea that God is all-powerful paints us into a theological corner where we have to hold him accountable for every heart attack, every malignant tumor, every fire, every flood, every automobile accident. Perhaps one story summarizes it. I got a letter from a Lutheran minister in rural Nebraska who told me that he had to do a funeral one Sunday for a 26-year-old man who had just died in an automobile crash. The man had been scheduled to be married that same Sunday in the same church on the same day, almost at the same hour for which his wedding was scheduled. They had to do the funeral, bury him in the church courtyard. The pastor came back to his office and the man's fiancée was waiting for him there. And she said to him, Pastor, if one more person tells me it's God's will, I'm going to scream. Why do they want me to hate God? Because I think that's what we do when we believe that nothing happens in the world unless God wills it. We either teach people to hate themselves for deserving it or to hate God for giving it to them when they didn't deserve it. I wanted to teach my people and anyone who would read my book that God is our friend and not our judge that these things happen against God's will and he suffers and grieves with us even as we do and that he doesn't have some sort of exalted plan for which, which makes these things right and desirable. And I've learned in the two and a half years that the book has been out that there is a great deal of anguish out there in the world and that the best way to deal with that anguish is to sit with people and hold their hands and persuade them that this is not right, it is not God's will, there is no good reason for it that in fact God does love and cherish them and doesn't want them to suffer, and that he is on their side. In the words of the psalmist, the psalmist doesn't say, I look up into the hills from where does my malignancy come, from where does my disease come, from where does my unemployment come. He says, I look up unto the hills from where does my health come. My health comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. It was from this perspective that I came to write about God in a way which I have since discovered is very similar to the seminal work that's being done here in Claremont. Thank you. I <clears throat> myself find so convincing the point that the fundamental character of God is goodness and love rather than 
sheer power and force that I'm often puzzled that um, there seems to be so much resistance to, to that idea. And I know since your work has reached so many people and you've had so many responses that you've become aware also of the kind of resistance to, to that. Can, can you reflect some with us about why people don't want to believe that? <clears throat> Why don't I tell them a story that I told our, our little committee earlier this afternoon. True story, I had an incident happen a few years ago. I got a notice from my bank that my checking account was overdrawn. And I got very upset because as far as I knew, I had a couple hundred dollars in the account. So I went down to the bank the next morning and I'm ready to pound on somebody's desk and say, what's going on here? Who do you think you're dealing with? I don't write checks if I don't have the money. Do you realize I had to take an hour from a very busy day and come down and straighten this out? turned out they were right. Uh, <laughs> the mistake was mine. I had entered a deposit twice and they had only credited it once. <laughs> I had a very strange and surprising reaction to that discovery. You know what I felt? I felt relieved. I felt relieved that the bank keeps such accurate records so that I don't have to. And then I could understand why people twist themselves into such emotional and intellectual knots to affirm every kind of rotten, lousy tragedy as God's will. They need to believe that everything is part of a purpose, that somebody is making this happen. The hardest thing for people to accept in my book, I find, is the idea of randomness. Why did this happen? There's no reason for it. It just happened. That's hard for people. People say, I could accept any kind of pain if I knew there was a reason for it. I can't accept meaningless pain. People say, if I thought that God sent me this sickness to purify me, to punish me, to make me an example for others, whatever the reason, as long as I knew there was a reason, I could take it. To say it's just bad genes, that wipes me out. Part of it, I think, is an element of uh, I don't want to condemn these people, I just want to disagree with them. I think it's an element of immaturity. People who are not prepared to hear the message that the well-being of the world depends on us. And that they want to say that, you know, we don't write the script, we're just following orders. We're just reading the lines. God pulls the strings, God writes the scripts. That absolves us of responsibility. Part of it, I think, is this tremendous need to know that somebody's driving the bus so we can just relax and sit back and not worry about where it's going. What I say to people today, partly, is that ultimately we have to forgive God and get over our anger at Him for giving us a world, instead of giving us a perfect world, giving us an unpredictable world where the right thing isn't going to happen unless we make it happen. People very much would like to feel that the right thing will happen. It's sort of like a it's a rough analogy, I hope it will do. You go to see a real scary movie, and you're not scared because you know somebody is directing the movie and he's going to make everything work out in the end. I think for a lot of people, life is a scary movie. And the only way they can sit there without really losing their popcorn is to assure themselves that God is the director and there's going to be a happy ending to it. And they get very upset if you say to them, you know, even God doesn't know how it's going to end. It seems to me that, that when one states it that way, some people are going to say, well, then it sounds like this is just humanism or atheism, and uh, we're just here in this uh, rotten mess and uh, trying to make the best of it. That's not all that, that, that you are saying about it, but what, what is it that God is doing in all of this? Okay, I'm very glad I have a chance to say that. No, I do not, I do not agree with, let's say, Bertrand Russell, that you know there is no God, the world is a loose ship, and all we can do is... Uh, you know, go down with the ship as brave gentlemen. Now, I don't believe that. I believe in a God who intervenes in our lives. He doesn't send the problem. He sends us the, the grace to respond to it. My argument with the insurance companies is what they call acts of God, I think, is using the Lord's name in vain. A flood, a fire, an earthquake is not an act of God. It's an act of blind, amoral nature, of a nature which cannot tell the difference between the good people and the bad ones who get in its way. But the efforts of the community to rebuild themselves after the flood or after the earthquake, that's the act of God. God, I think, does three things. First, 
he has given us a world which is predictable, which basically runs by laws. I was speaking at a synagogue in Newport Beach last night, and a young man who was an Orthodox Jew came up to me and said afterwards, why can't an all-powerful God suspend the laws of nature if they're going to hurt an innocent person? So I said to him, can an all-powerful God make a four-sided triangle? No, of course not. All right, can an all-powerful God create a universal law and make it apply sometimes and not other times? And he didn't quite understand the question, but I said, no, this is a contradiction in terms. If laws of nature, it may be, it may be very cruel that laws of nature make innocent people suffer, but how livable would the world be if laws of nature sometimes applied and sometimes didn't apply? If I have to get on a plane back to Boston tomorrow, and I don't know if the plane will fly safely, or if the laws of astrophysics will stop operating because there are a whole bunch of mafia chieftains on the plane and God wants it to crash, who can live like this? <laughs> if I don't understand why one person, let's say, gets cancer and another doesn't, I have to affirm that there are reasons, even if I don't know the reasons. And I sometimes think when we care enough to spend as much money on cancer research as we spend on cigarettes and cosmetics to make us sick, when we care enough to pay medical researchers what we pay quarterbacks and left fielders in this country, maybe somebody will come up with a reason. Basically, I've got to believe there are rules, and God has given us a, an orderly world that makes sense. More importantly, I sometimes think the best line in my book is a line I didn't write. It's a quotation from a 19th century Hasidic rabbi who said, human beings are God's language. That is, what people, when, when people are hurt and cry out to God, God responds not by talking to them in Hebrew, Latin, or English, depending on your religious preference. God responds by coming to us in the incarnation of good people. There's a story I love to tell about the little boy whose mother sends him on an errand and it takes him a long time to get back. When he finally gets back, his mother says, where were you? I was worried about you. Boy answers, oh, there's a kid down the street whose tricycle broke and he was crying because he couldn't fix it. And I felt bad, so I stopped to help him. Mother says, you know how to fix a tricycle? Boy says, no, of course not. I sat and I helped him cry. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I've learned? Why me? Why is God doing this to me? It's not a question. It's not a question. It is a cry of pain. And you respond to the person who says, why me? Not by answering her question, but by assuaging her pain. Think of it. Your best friend says to you, what did I ever do to deserve this? Does he want you to give him a list of things he did to deserve this? <laughs> He wants you to tell him that he doesn't deserve this, that he's a good person and what is happening to him is unfair. My aphorism, suffering people need not explanation, but consolation. You don't help them by explaining why it's right that they're suffering. You help them by holding their hands. I, I remember when I was a young, naive rabbi, I would go into a house where there had been a tragedy and people would say to me, Rabbi, why would God let this happen to such a good person? And I thought they were asking me a question about God. And that's fine, because I know about that. I took courses in it. <laughs> and I would, I would offer them a 15-minute summary of my senior theology course in rabbinic school. And when I was done and their, their eyes had sort of glazed over, I would say to them, now, I know this is a little bit technical. Maybe you didn't get it the first time. Would you like me to repeat it? <laughs> and they would say, Rabbi, please, we've suffered enough. <laughs> I've learned, and what I do now is I don't explain God. I say I'm sorry, and I hold people's hands and I listen to them. Because they don't want explanations, they want consolation. They want to know that they are worth caring about. One of the things God manifests himself in is the capacity of people, despite their squeamishness, it's no fun to go see your friend suffering, to reach out and be a good friend and neighbor. And one of the things that God does, I think, is to give us the capacity to transcend ourselves. I think I still believe in God because I am always seeing ordinary people do extraordinary things. I am seeing people come up with qualities of soul that they would be the first ones to tell you they didn't have last week. True story. 
it was June of 1981, I announced to my family that my goal for that summer was to get into shape to run the Falmouth Road Race. I don't know if anybody here has ever been on Cape Cod, but every August there's a seven-mile mini-marathon. Big deal in Falmouth. Everybody goes down there. Everybody has to choose between participating in the race or watching it. I'm lucky. The way I run, I do both. <laughs> Anyhow, to, to encourage my, my efforts to run seven miles, my daughter got me a t-shirt to wear when I run, and on the back of this t-shirt she imprinted Isaiah 4031, which you will recall reads, those who trust in the Lord will have their strength renewed, they shall run and not grow weary. <laughs> Didn't help me when I ran, but, uh, <laughs> but it's been very important to me ever since. I find God in the midst of human tragedy not as the author of the tragedy for some obscure purpose which we can't comprehend, but as the source of the astonishing capacity of the human soul to survive a tragedy. And by the way, that's what you do with tragedy. You don't explain it, you don't justify it, you survive it. God manifests himself not by sending us illness, but by giving us more strength, more love, more courage than we ever thought we were capable of having. And when we used up all the patience and all the strength we start with, we turn to God and he gives us more. Now, when I say that God is not all-powerful, I don't mean to teach that God is an innocent bystander watching what happens to us in this world. I believe in a God who stands for goodness and helpfulness. He does not send the problem. He sends the grace to deal with the problem. When an airplane crashes in Washington, D.C. and hits the 16th Street Bridge, that's not God's will, that's physics. But when Lenny Skutnik happens to be walking by, and without understanding what he's doing, for the first time in his life, becomes a hero, jumps into the river to save the stewardess. That, I believe, is God in action. When we think of God that way, it does leave us with uh, profound uncertainties about the future. Yes. And these days, many of us have enormous anxiety about the future. That is, we know that we have weapons with which we can not only destroy our enemy and ourselves, but the, the whole of humanity. Could you comment how you see the relationship of what you're saying to that? John, that's very interesting. <coughs> Excuse me. I was in Europe right after that Sunday in October when the people came out and marched against the Pershing missiles. My book was translated into German and Danish, and I went over to do some publicity and promotional work for the book. I was lecturing in Denmark to the uh, public lecture to the Jewish community of Copenhagen that week. It happened to be a very bad night to lecture. That same night, the Danish national soccer team was on television in the semifinals of the European Cup. Uh, right after I finished my lecture, the chief rabbi of Denmark, who was introducing me, made the announcement that the Danish team had just lost one nothing, and that they'd be selling a lot of copies of my book tomorrow. <laughs> The first question after my lecture was a question I had never been asked in the United States. Somebody asked about what are the implications of your theology for the prospects of nuclear war? Does your view of God have anything to teach us? And I didn't know for a second. I was kind of taken aback. Nobody had ever asked me that before. And I thought about it, and I said, the only connection I can find is this. You cannot depend on God to pull us back from the brink. If God has given us freedom, if God has permitted us to evolve as unique creatures with the sense of moral responsibility that we have, that gift of freedom is irrevocable. If we're going to do something bad, whether it's robbing a local bank or detonating a nuclear bomb, we are going to be free to do it. If human beings were not going to stop Hitler in the 1930s, God was not going to stop him. The world would have been a lot pleasanter and less messy had God struck Hitler down with a heart attack or an automobile accident in 1935. He didn't. Not that he chose not to. The rules of the game were that God does not intervene in our lives. And if people are going to be crazy enough to contemplate a nuclear encounter, in which not only will we die, but all the future generations of mankind will not be born, you cannot count on God 
to save us from the results of our own folly. That's what I said. When I finished, the chief rabbi of Denmark got up and said that, with all due respect to our guest speaker, he has faith that God will not let this happen. And whatever else happens, he cannot believe that God would let a nuclear war wipe out mankind. He has to believe that God loves this world sufficiently to save us from our own foolishness. And while I was not about to argue with him, that response worried me very much. I'm afraid there is a part of us that is prepared to believe that. You know, it's kind of like the life is a horror movie image. There's a part of us that says this is so unbearable, God would not let it happen. And I'm sorry to say there is no evidence in all of human history that I'm aware of that God will intervene and save us from the consequences of our own foolishness. Perhaps he will in this way. God will not stop us from doing something. God will manifest himself in good, dedicated, reasonable people who will try and awaken us to the consequences of our folly. But if we will not listen to the voice of God within us, I cannot rest confident that God will pull us back from the brink. I wish that were not my answer, but I think if this is in fact the truth, we had better tell people that this is the truth so we don't misplace our trust. There's a, a, a terribly difficult line, isn't there, that <clears throat> to deceive ourselves into thinking that everything will be all right because we believe in God and God would not let us do that leads us to a kind of complacency. And then if we say, no, that's not the case, uh, it depends upon what we do, that may lead a great many people into despair. And it seems to me that despair and complacency have a very similar result. That is, both Alas, of them yes. yeah. seem to leave us inactive. Try this, John, as a middle ground between those two very undesirable ends. God will not save us from the results of our own foolishness, but God will give us everything we need to save ourselves. God will not withhold from his creatures the wisdom and the perseverance to make the right decision. Whether we, ha whether we will have the tools, whether we use those tools to save ourselves and future generations from distinction is up to us. The very least that God does for us is say to us, a happy ending is not impossible. Life is not a tease. Life has within it the possibility for humane, decent living. The tools are all there. All we have to do is realize it and use it because we have come to depend on ourselves. The things you mentioned and passed over rather quickly with respect to how God deals with us in our suffering is that God suffers with us in our suffering. And that's an idea that's very important to me. I wonder if you could tell us about where that idea has come from in your own reflection. That's interesting. I have gotten some reactions from Jewish readers of my book who were uncomfortable with the image of God's suffering. They seem to think it's a Christian image and not a Jewish one. <laughs> no, it's certainly a very Christian image, and it is played down in Judaism. But I think it has roots in Judaism. There are legends about God weeping when he sees what people do to each other, God going into exile with his people when the temple is destroyed. My teacher, Professor Abraham Heschel, wrote a book-length treatment of the prophets where he characterizes the prophets as people who could see the world from God's point of view and who could feel God's pain at the injustice and the suffering that goes on in this world. But more than anything else, this was not the source of my imagery of God's suffering. It was just supportive texts. The image, I think, is that I had to affirm God's goodness, God's decency, God's justice, God's compassion. And anything which could not be reconciled with that, I could not attribute to God. If we suffer, if we suffer vicariously, empathically with people who are suffering, I can only believe that this is God's pathos reflecting itself in us. It's not that we are being anthropomorphic about God, as my teacher Abraham Heschel used to say. We're not being anthropomorphic and describing God in human terms. To talk about people being righteously indignant when they read about injustice, to talk about people being compassionate when they see suffering, is to be theomorphic about man. 
not to describe God in human terms, but to describe men in divine terms. To respond to suffering with compassion is not to make God human, but to make human beings divine. I had to affirm that our own capacity for pathos is a reflection of the supreme pathos, the supreme anger in the face of unfairness, the supreme compassion in the face of pain, which originates in God and reflects itself in us. You brought up uh, the fact that on this particular point, some, some Jews said that was a dangerous idea for Jews. It sounded too Christian. I certainly agree with you that it is both Jewish and Christian and not something in between. Were there any other respects in which you felt that you got a different kind of response from Jewish readers and from Christian readers? Surprisingly very little. What really astonished me about this is, I'll tell you, I wrote a book three, four years ago, which I thought a few thousand Jews and a few relatives of mine would read, and not beyond that. I never expected it to be received in the Christian community the way it was. One of the things I want to say, by the way, is that it is the Protestant clergy who made my book a bestseller. They did it. They picked it up, they gave sermons about it, and the word of mouth began to spread. They would hand copies of the book to people who had had a loss, people in hospitals, and it was essentially through their work that the book spread beyond a very small circle of personal <laughs> friends of mine and became a na national phenomenon. I get a few letters from Christians who assume that because I'm a rabbi, I've never heard of the New Testament, and that if I would just read it with an open mind, I would rewrite my book in a more correct perspective. <laughs> but I also get letters from Orthodox Jews who suggest that instead of giving so many speeches, I should go back and read the book of Isaiah, with which I'm obviously unfamiliar. No, what, what really struck me is that so many people of so many different religious persuasions were open to, to the message of the book. They wanted to be comforted by the idea that God is on their side and that God is good and that God is there to enhance their sense of personal worth. There were virtually no differences between Jews and Christians. There were elements in both communities of a fundamentalist nature who could not accept my book because they thought I was diminishing God. I will insist that I am not diminishing God, that I am in fact adding to God's greatness when I identify his power as the power to sustain and the power to rebuild rather than the power to control. Uh, David Griffin has already taught me something very important today. This one insight alone made my trip out here to Claremont worthwhile, that we need not define power as coercive power. It can be a persuasive power. It can be liberating power. It can be the power to turn somebody's energy loose rather than the power to pull his strings. And that's a kind of power that God has perhaps an unlimited quantity. We hope you have found this interview helpful. The Process and Faith program of the Center for Process Studies is very pleased to be able to make it available to you.